thanks for having me here today. Um, it's an honor to talk to you guys. Uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about is our farm, but also some of the businesses of food, how we got to where we are. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about myself. Um, like Dr. Ayer said, my name's Jordan Green. Um, I'm a full-time, what I would call, regenerative farmer. I don't like the organic label, like he said. Um, I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and then I'm also a graduate of the apprenticeship program at Polyface Farm under Joel Salatin that some of you may have heard about. Um, before we get into talking about our farm, though, two things I did want to talk about that, uh, you know, that are kind of handled from my side of food. Um, you, know, you as uh, dietetics and dietitians and nutritionalists um, you know, handle a lot of the uh, other side. I look at the production side. Two major questions, though, that the industry is wrestling with um, is, is meat killing the planet? Or is it even ethical? Uh, that's a big topic of discussion. Uh, the second one is how do we feed everybody? So because on our farm we primarily are raising meats, we're doing beef, uh, poultry, pigs, eggs, that kind of stuff, this is the question that we get all the time, um, especially on social media, is meat even killing the planet? Uh, so both of these are pretty supercharged questions though, and everybody has an opinion and pretty entrenched uh, perspectives on it. So what I'm hoping today is maybe give you guys a little bit of a different uh, perspective on these questions and share with you guys some thoughts maybe you haven't heard before. Uh, I'm assuming there's a couple vegetarians in the crowd and, and maybe even some vegans. I love you guys too. I'm, I'm not here to, uh, to convert you, but let's uh, hear me out. One thing we can agree on, though, for sure, that if we were to Google, is meat killing the planet, there's, what, 800-something thousand responses there. Um, and a lot of research and articles and, and things that are good points on this topic. <clears throat> One thing we can be sure on, though, our planet is supporting more humans today than at any other time in history with a limited set of resources, and we can easily see the destruction that is caused on ecosystems by humans and by the animals that we are farming. So these are a couple of pictures right here of what we would call industrial um, livestock farming. Uh, this would also be called CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. So before we get into this though, to properly context any discussion, it's helpful to clarify some terminology. And so for the scope of our conversation here today, when I say meats, I'm primarily talking about meats coming from herbivores, so that'd be your cows, goats, sheep, so on, um, swine, pigs, and birds, so turkeys, um, chicken, quail, things like that. Fish is another huge category of meat that's out there. Um, that's something that is way outside of my scope as there's pretty much no lakes here in the Shenandoah Valley and no fish. Um, so when I'm talking about meats, I'm talking about critters that have legs. Um, when I say conventional agriculture, I'm referring to a widely practiced method of concentrating animals into crowded pens or buildings for the purpose of feeding them the slaughter weight. So that's something like you see here and in the slide before. So this one over here, this would be what we call beef feedlot. These are all uh, cows that are brought in here to raise to a slaughter weight. Um, this is poultry right here, of which there are thousands of these houses in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, this is dairy over here, and this would be egg production. So this is what we would call a CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. Um, I'm also, though, when I say conventional agriculture, referring to the practice of using pieces of land, large tracts of land, for the production of annual cereal crops. So things like corn, wheat, soybeans, and so on. So back to our first question, though, is meat killing the planet? <clears throat> We've heard a lot of arguments um, per, you know, proposed on why that is the case. And I think we can narrow it down to a couple points across the spectrum for people who advocate this uh, meatless uh, point of view. First one would be the inhumane treatment of animals. As you can see, um, this is what we would call a sow facility or a farrowing barn. So these are all uh, female pigs that are used just to produce more baby pigs that are turned into bacon and so on. These animals never leave that crate, ever. Now they might go from here. These are called gestation stalls. So when they are 
impregnated. They're put in this stall. They stay there for uh, a little over three and a half months, and then they'll move them into a farrowing unit where they get a uh, pen that's a little bit bigger, but not too much. The animal is still not allowed to turn around because they don't want her to lay down on the babies and smush them. So over 95% of uh, pigs and chickens are raised in these type of environments. The next big uh, concern that I hear about is runoff and water consumption. As you can see here, this is uh, back to this, this would be the outside of that hog barn, and this is discharging all of that manure that those pigs are producing, and they move out into these large uh, holding areas called lagoons. <coughs> so you can see here, this is a farm in North Carolina, these three hog barns, and this is the lake of all their manure, which is lovely, I can tell you that. Um, water consumption. Oh, one more picture here. Anybody want to take a guess what this is? So, this is your lagoon of manure. Your lagoon must be agitated in order to digest all of the manure. So this is your agitator. And they back that puppy in there, and it starts pumping and cycling the manure through there. I would hate to live in that house back there. That's probably not, uh, not a pleasant experience. So this is something that happens when hurricanes come through an area like North Carolina where hog uh, confinement rearing was pretty popular. Um, and you get 30 inches of rain that falls and, and wind and so on, power goes out, pumps go down, and your lagoons, which would be sitting here and here and maybe up there, they're all going down the river to bless the Chesapeake Bay with their nutrients. So that is a huge consideration and a big, big problem with livestock production is the pilot. This is a very common graph you will see if you Google um, these kind of topics. This is put out by the guys who did the movie Cowspiracy. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that one. Um, they put this out, and there's some valid points in here. There's definitely issues of deforestation occurring, water use. Um, you know, they're saying that one hamburger is using 660 gallons of water to produce waste, emissions, climate change, all of that stuff. Very scary. That would kind of fall you know, into the general pollution, that meat eating is uh, causing pollution across the board of bad smells, groundwater contamination, um, something like this, oceanic dead zones. So this is down, who went down here for spring break in this area, or was maybe over here in Florida? Um, this is called the oceanic dead zone in the Gulf of uh, Mexico. It occurs every year, and this is from excess nutrient runoff from up in the Midwest, where a lot of crop production and um, animal rearing is going, and right there is the line. So over here is you know relatively healthy seawater, and over here, what happens is there's so much nutrients coming down the Mississippi River and going into the Gulf that it uh, turns into a bacterial feeding zone, and the bacteria consumes all of the oxygen that's in the water, uh, consuming the nutrients and it results in this water basically being oxygen depleted, which causes ecosystem collapse. That's why they call it a dead zone. There's nothing living in there. And every year, this is the size of a small state. So, all these stack up to some very legitimate concerns um, that need answers. And I'm not going to dismiss them, but we'll kind of drop this where it is and come back to it here in a little bit. The other reason that we hear for the, the meat-free is the dietary considerations. Um, now, that's not my area. That's, that's what you guys do. Uh, but certainly there could be advantages to a uh, plant-based diet alone or maybe less meat and more plants. Maybe for some people that is the best way for them to eat. Um, who's heard of these uh, um, ticks now that are out in the wild that make you allergic to red meat? If you get bit by one of those things, you're you're now, it's an allergen to you. All right. Second question was, how do we feed everyone? This would probably be the second question that I hear. After all, we've seen a world population go from, uh, you know, if you're back here, like 1800, I think is when it crossed 1 billion. Now we're up here, mid sevens. And we're looking at hitting, you know, 9 to 10 billion people in the next 30 years, which, um, you know, for me, I'll be, you know, hopefully retired by then, but for you guys, you know, you'll be late 40s or 50s by the time there's 10 billion people on the planet. 
where this ties back into about uh, meat eating is that the animals are eating all of the food that the humans could be eating. You can see right here is a graph for the last 50 years of meat consumption patterns rising. Um, this is in the United States. You'll see this number kind of uh, corresponding to developing nations. China is certainly one that's coming along pretty rapidly as well. But you have consumption increasing, uh, what would you say, maybe two to three fold on meat consumption in the last 100 years? Roundabouts. So if we only stopped farming all of these animals that are eating the grain, we would have all these extra resources available for people. So who's watched the Cowspiracy movie? Any of you guys? That, that's kind of their main point, that if we weren't feeding grains to animals, we could feed all these hungry people. So if there's all these hungry people in the world, we just stop feeding them with uh, the grains that are going to animal, animal farming, we'd be able to feed everyone. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? This is a graph I found out there. Every year in the United States alone, 41 million tons of food is fed to 7 billion livestock to produce 7 million tons of uh, saleable meat. So it seems like we're burning a lot of food to produce meat. We can see, though, when we look at um, these issues of world hunger and um, population growth, that the argument of if we just use the grain for people instead of animals is a common misconception, and it's not actually true. One of the a couple of things I like to point out is this is what you will hear from a lot of uh, the cowspiracy type folks. And uh, this is something else to consider, is the amount of food that's being wasted. For every one hungry person in the world, 1.42 tons of food is wasted each year. World hunger is not as much a product of underproduction or diverting grains to animal consumption. Distribution and poverty are the primary causations of hunger in the world. Between 30 and 50 percent of food already produced is thrown away due to spoilage or grocery carts and plates that are overfilled. Mm -hmm. Obviously, being a farmer, I pay attention to what's going on in uh, you know, the United States and around the globe when it comes to production of food. Right now, we are in one of the largest grain gluts the world has ever experienced. Um, and this was an article from last year that um, you know, we are producing so much grain that we don't even know what to do with it now. So we're piling it on runways, in parking lots. We don't even have like buildings to put it in anymore. Um, companies are leasing huge ships and just parking them out in the sea, full of grain, just sitting there waiting for a market to come up. This was just came out uh, a couple days ago. This is Outlook for Q2 of 2018, which we're in right now. If you look down here, um, you know, six point whatever percent gain despite abundant supplies. Right now we're sitting on about 14 months of surplus grain in the world. So if we stopped growing any grain for the next 14 months, we'd be fine. But despite that, we're still gonna grow some more. A couple pictures down to show you guys. This right here, that's all corn. That is a mountain of corn. Other large piles like this. This is one of the largest granaries in the world. You can see right here, that's a train. Give me an idea of how big that building is. And those are full. Availability and consumption of all food types has risen over the last 150 years so much that it's affecting the very genetic makeup of human beings. You realize on average now we're several inches taller than humans were in the past. We're bigger. We're living twice as long as people did 200 years ago. We're wasting more food than we ever have in history. Some is due to um, you know, simply not eating it in time. Um, other food wastage is because our trade agreements only allow us to ship so much elsewhere. So this was, um, this right here is a bin full of cherries that um, <clears throat> I saw an article last year that this orchard was having to throw away all of their cherries because the United States had already met its quota of shipping cherries elsewhere in the world. So we weren't allowed to send any more anywhere else. So they're just taking them back out in the field and dumping them out there for the bees. Right now, there's so much food available that the price index for things like corn, soybeans, and cattle are at or below break-even numbers. Many farmers are growing crops just hoping to make enough money 
to pay the loan payments on their equipment and the seeds and the mortgages they have on their farms. They're also being supported by government subsidization to continue that process. Like I said, there's just over a year of extra corn sitting in supply right now that we know of. So world hunger is not due to, to uh, a production issue. It is primarily due to distribution issues. It's not because we aren't growing enough or sending too much corn to the cows. But does that mean that those points that I made earlier are not valid? No, those are still some very valid points that we're going to get into next. The very dark side to this abundance of food cheaply produced and overconsumed by the Western world. It's burning the house down. But at an ever accelerating rate, the arid portions of the world are desertifying. So desertification is the process of green areas of the world turning into desert. And you may ask, why is that occurring? <clears throat> Anybody want to take a guess what these, this is? This is not some kind of new camel pattern. All right, this is a satellite shot of agricultural production. So each one of these little circles that you see right here is a one mile circle or a quarter mile circle, depending on how, um, how big they are, or there's one square mile of land contained in there. This is how a lot of the cereal grain production of the world is done. I think it's something like only 15 to 20 percent of all agricultural lands receive enough rainfall every year to actually grow the crop with the, the rain that drops in them. So we must water the crops via irrigation, pumping water up out of the ground. That's why you see these little circles. In the middle of each one is a well that they are pumping water out into a big boom that just goes in a circle around the well continually. You'll see some of them in the valley, but typically if you go out west uh, in flat countries where you'll see a lot more of these. So desertification is cropland turning to sand lots at an alarming rate as millennia worth of topsoil that has accumulated is consumed by carbon hungry crops or lost to wind and water erosion. This right here was old growth forest, let's say 20 years ago. This is in South America. This is now in, pretty much entirely in soybean production. And at the center of each one of these squares, each square is three miles on each side. At the center is a little village that's supporting all of these, um, all of these crop fields around it. And it's laid out very nicely. We can see here what desertification looks like. And it is huge chunks of the planet that for various reasons are turning from green to not green. Crops play a huge role in this process. Also, mismanagement of livestock. Overgrazing is, a, is a, another issue. Uh, World Wildlife Organization uh, put out an article, and they said that half of the topsoil on the planet has been lost in the last 150 years. If you think about it, eons worth <coughs> of topsoil smoked in 150 years. Generating just three centimeters of topsoil takes 1,000 years for a natural process to do. Now, I'll show you guys this. <clears throat> this is out in Iowa. Uh, when you're driving down the interstate, this is a monument when you come into the state. Uh, and if you are just looking at it, you might think it's like some kind of a decorative uh, lighting apparatus you know, out in front of the building. This is actually a monument to soil. In 1850, the average topsoil depth in the state of Iowa, which is one of the largest corn producing states in the country and in the world, um, the average topsoil depth was 15.5 inches. So that's represented over here. Over here, this is 2000, uh, I think it's seven or eight that's on there. We're less than five inches of topsoil. So we are losing dirt at an alarming rate. Now, dirt is not a very glamorous topic to talk about, I know, uh, but it is absolutely critical to really all of human civilization, that we need dirt to grow our food in. And uh, until it starts raining food out of the sky, that's the system that we have to work with. So we see a transition to agriculture from natural vegetation often cannot hold the soil, and many of these plants, such as coffee, cotton, palm oil, corn, soybeans, and wheat, actually increase soil erosion beyond the soil's ability to maintain itself. So the soil does build itself as part of what we would call a carbon cycle, but it's extremely slow. Equipment, an average crop of corn can consume up to a tenth of an inch of topsoil 
per year. And that's just what the plants extract from the soil, um, from the organic matter to grow, to grow the corn. That's not counting what we would lose from erosion due to tillage. <clears throat> this is the current state of <coughs> soil in the world, soil degradation. I think it's 74% of the world's topsoils are degraded right now. Some are extremely degraded. And if you look here, um, we kind of go from stable soils, which mostly are in tundra areas where agricultural activity is pretty uh, minimal, and in some, some other areas, typically tropical areas. And then we have degraded soil, which it would be most of um, you know, here and here, <clears throat> where a lot of the world's cereal crop production occurs. And we see what happens after we eventually lose all of our topsoil. It goes to without vegetation. It just turns to sand. In addition to losing soil, we, we grow crops. We are losing the water it takes to irrigate them. So like I said, most crops must be irrigated. This is a good one to use as an example. I was just, um, if you go back to the other slide, yeah. isn't it like for, you know, the top of Africa and like up in Russia, the reason why the soil is like that is because of the extreme weather? It's less like, you know, over grazing and, and all these other things. It's like weather. We can't really. Well, sure. Up here is frozen dirt, so we can't, we can't right. get at it. Um, if you look at how ecosystems operate, you have arid ecosystems and you have human ecosystems. So the reason why around here you could go rip all the grass out of your yard and a couple weeks later it'd be grass again is we're in a humid um, environment where rain is constantly falling and plants are going to recover exposed soil. If you look at arid ecosystems, which would be the Sahara, western part of the United States, a lot of Australia, a big swath up through Mongolia there, um, they are very brittle ecosystems. But what's interesting, though, if you read uh, accounts of settlers first settling, say, the Midwest, or the, the West, New Mexico, Arizona, um, Texas, these very uh, arid, dry parts of the country, that now are desert with cactuses growing in them. When they were moving through in the mid-1700s, 1800s, um, they reported prairie grass 8 to 10 feet tall. So a arid... Um, the ecosystem will grow plants to cover the soil, but it's much easier to destroy it. And that's where mismanagement of livestock, um, you know, it's caused the areas of New Mexico and the American West to turn into the desert that we see now. But once you lose um, your, your covering on the soil, what you see happen is a wild temperature fluctuation inside of that soil from night to day. If you go out into any desert, it'll be 120 in the day, 40 at night. Without having a plant covering on the soil, now the soil is doing that as well. And you get into a kind of a critical collapse phase of, of the plant life. If you want to watch a fantastic video uh, from a guy named Alan Savory, he gave a TED talk um, called, um, I don't have a slide here or not, but if you just Google Alan Savory TED talk, it's a guy who for the last 60 years has worked on how do we answer this question of arid environments and livestock. And what he has to say in that talk will probably blow your mind, so I won't spoil it for you. <clears throat> so going back to our water resources that we're using, this is one of the, the biggest ones uh, in the Midwest, the uh, Ogallala Aquifer, I'm saying that right. And this is showing its rate of decline. Um, this aquifer, I think, is projected to be empty in about 80 years. <coughs> and it takes, um, every year it only recharges half to one inch, and right now it's dropping um, several feet a year in places, or even more. Now, why are these dropping? <laughs> and unless you think I'm just picking on the United States saying we're doing it, this is a common issue everywhere in the world, is aquifers are going away. So soil is being washed away 10 to 40 times faster than they are being replaced. And if we look here, we can see principal causes of soil um, erosion. Industrialization and the purple agricultural practices, overgrazing. So you can see um, in areas like Australia, that's causing a huge amount of their uh, soil loss. But we see here in North America our principal reason for soil loss in agricultural practices. That's not grazing, that's tillage, that's growing crops. Tillage um, being the main reason, <clears throat> and then irrigation are what are causing these two major problems that we as farmers are now wrestling with. 
So we can see there's a valid concern for our first two questions. Is meat eating harmful? How do we feed everyone? However, a lot of times the solutions offered by many groups are not answers to the right questions. You don't answer the question of, um, is meat eating killing the planet by eating more grain? Because grain is doing it just as fast. Even if, we, if the alternative to eating meat is to eat more grains and processed food, we still run out of soil and water. It is this tillage that depletes the soil, and it is irrigation that is draining our aquifers. So what are we using all of these grains for? You know, these mountains of corn that are sitting out there and, and everywhere. What are, exactly are we using them for? So again, back to me picking on Iowa, uh, because Iowa loves corn. That's, that's like their main crop, and so they are very proud of what they do with corn. Biggest use of corn is not even for eating. It's for ethanol. Down here, this would be the part that is uh, assigned to agriculture. It's only 26% of corn that is produced. And of this, a big chunk of it is being fed right here to beef and to dairy, which are two animals that nature never intended to eat corn. It only exists because the government is pumping money into it. And it takes approximately one gallon of petroleum fuel or natural gas to produce one gallon of ethanol fuel. So it is a one-to-one -one trade off for no other reason than to prop up a grain industry. It doesn't solve any environmental uh, considerations or problems. We have a, a heavy reliance on petroleum, uh, and a heavy reliance on these mechanical tillages and irrigation processes <coughs> with agriculture. So advocating a plant-based diet alone will actually increase hunger in the world and no way feed one additional per person. We would have to abandon all of these areas that we can't plow and harvest that we are currently raising herbivores on. Um, I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but I can tell you pretty much all the acreage on our farm we could not do a lot of tillage on. Production isn't the problem for feeding 10 billion people. Distribution and our consumption habits are. Right now it takes 10 plus calories of energy to produce one edible calorie of food. Any of you guys math majors? You can ask them if that's a sustainable uh, workout figure. Um, that's not sustainable. We're, we're burning 10 to get one. It, this is almost like a bad joke. Hey, I can eat 10 calories at the dessert bar, but it only has the effect of one. That, that's not going to last for very long. It's taking an insane amount of energy in the form of petroleum from the past and consuming huge amounts of resources that we should be conserving for the future, namely our topsoil and aquifers. We're burning the past down and robbing the future ability to keep producing food. So how did agriculture get here? This may sound like a crap, you know, how do we deal with this problem? Um, how did we get down the rabbit hole? So we'll take a two minute tour here through food history and it goes something like this. Ancient man chasing Animals around the savanna and eating meats, fruits, roots, nuts, limited only by his ability to procure his sustenance. Pretty much whatever an early man could eat, he was eating. Man learning how to use tools and beginning to herd animals. From here we see thousands of years of small scale farming occur. We see Egyptians with their Dalmatian cows beginning to plow the ground and plant crops as well as organized orchards. We're seeing some of the foundations of, of scaled agriculture. We see the Romans continuing this, and uh, you know, I'm primarily talking about Western agriculture here, but I'm sure it's on a similar track in the Eastern world as well. So we've got our castles, and we're out plowing the ground, and we're harvesting stuff, and we're planting stuff down here, and it must have been a really good party because we're out in our togas with our lutes and harps, and we're harvesting the plants, and it must have been quite a party. Moving forward to medieval times, you begin to see the very early stages of mechanization in this process. You see wheels being used. You see wooden plows, but they now have a steel iron shoe on it. And now we're starting to plow the ground at a little bit more of an efficient pace. Grains start becoming more and more of a centerpiece in human diet, but not for livestock because it's still an insane amount of, of human effort to produce a grain crop. So we're going to eat it ourselves, and the animals can fend for themselves. 
Um, one thing that's interesting, maybe it's just the way the guy uh, you know, painted the picture here, but they're doing a lot of this on hills. We're starting to see a lot of the, the early signs of this erosion problem beginning to occur. Jump forward up to the uh, 1800s. Mankind invents new machinery, giving us new, new tools to conquer the soil. So it's no longer us out there pushing the plow or us flogging the Dalmatian cows. It is machines doing it. First we have steam machines, and we have, uh, well, we have horse machines pulling the harvesters, and we begin to see the Industrial Revolution begin to play a part in this. We see the greatest leap forward, though, in agriculture when this guy comes along. This guy, his name is Fritz Haber. He's a German. He develops a process for extracting a substance called ammonium nitrate out of the air. And that was uh, primarily not used for agriculture and growing crops. It was used for blowing stuff up. So he, uh, he invented that process in, I believe, 1913. And it was a way for the German military to have uh, ammonium nitrate put in munitions because the Allies had cut off their supply from South America of uh, natural nitrate. And they needed a way to do it at scale to continue a war. So we have ammonium nitrate now being used in two world wars for 30 years. Obviously, wars do great things for industrial processes. We can debate the politics of wars um, at, at another time, but they do advance technology very quickly and rapidly. World War II wraps up. We still have these facilities that are producing mass amounts of ammonium nitrate, and some genius figures out, hey, if we start throwing this stuff on plants, it makes them grow really well in the form of NPK. That is when you see the beginning of putting fertilizers together with the uh, machinery advances, advances in breeding of plants, and that begins what we would call the Green Revolution that happened in the late 1950s through the 1960s, where production of food on the planet skyrocketed. So mankind now begins to use industry and chemistry to cash in on the resource of soil. We can grow a lot of stuff now and make a lot of money on our, on our piece of ground. So we have here, this is a, a planting machine that is quite large. Um, more harvesting combines. Again, you're seeing here the, the result of what technology and um, human ingenuity has done, which is these are fantastic, but for the problem of destroying our soil. So populations and the supply of food has exploded as a result of these um, advances in, in humankind. And this leads us back to now we have begun to concentrate animals into tightly packed groups um, because it's more efficient to have all of our grains transported on huge ships where we need them to keep all of our animals in tight little areas where we can offload by mechanical processes all the grain through augers that go down here and that feeds all of the birds and humans become a very small piece of the uh, production of animals. So this one guy right here is pretty much probably the only guy who runs that whole show. The problem is as we burn down our soil we have begun to rely <coughs> More and more, uh, this would be from 1930s, erosion loss during the Great <coughs> Bowl, 16 million acres destroyed by erosion as a result of having huge uh, mechanized processes. Right now, our agricultural hope is being hung on technology and biotech, and we are hoping this will save us as the means of natural production continue to disappear. So if you go to any um, any big ag school, go down to Virginia Tech and talk to talk to those guys down there. Um, if you get them to honestly admit the only thing that can really, you know, where industry is fo focusing its efforts when it comes to large-scale agriculture is biotech has to save us. We're not quite sure how, but it's hopefully will uh, happen before we run out of dirt. So. Are we stuck in this trap of our own making as natural means to produce food is declining and the technological basis to replace it hasn't proven itself to work yet? Because eventually this 10 to 1 calorie conversion rate is going to run out. Now, so this, that kind of sets the stage for what we're doing about it. And the reason I go through all that is I'm a big picture guy. I like to know the why of things. I, you know, how did we end up where we are? And to give you a contrast to what we are doing about it. 
So I got my start when I was 15 uh, years old in agriculture. My family moved here to the valley. Uh, my first job was working on a farm that had large poultry houses on it like this. So this was a fairly daily experience for me, walking in those houses and, um, and working in that environment. 25 parts per million ammonia atmosphere inside of a poultry house, uh, which is like a two, book, two by four hitting your eyeballs when you walk in there. So it was, besides the, uh, you know, the ecological issues, it was a good experience for me though, uh, in learning how industrial practices work, how these, how this type of livestock production is done. And I knew I wanted to farm at that point, but I did not want to farm that way. There, there had to be a different way to do this at scale. 2001, I got the opportunity to go do an apprenticeship at Polyface Farm, which is about an hour south of here. That was founded by this guy right here, <coughs> and Joel Salatin, uh, prolific writer and speaker now. Um, and one of the folks who has done a lot of work to bring a more natural approach to raising livestock um, to the public discussion, to the public sphere. You know, he's building on a lot of guys before him, I'm building on what he's done, but this was the first farm where I had exposure to how do we do this um, animal production without the uh, you know, inhumane treatment of the animals, without polluting the rivers, without all this other stuff. You know, how, is, how, how did animals exist on this planet for so long without destroying it themselves? There must be some, something that we're missing. So that is where I learned about uh, moving animals on pasture, on ground grass, on building topsoil, on uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of different things that we'll, we'll jump into here. When I left Polyface, uh, I was there for about 14 months learning these systems. Um, went around the country, worked on some different farms, helping them get started. And in uh, 2003, I actually joined the Marine Corps. It was something that I always wanted to do, and finally got the opportunity to do it. So I took what I call a five-year break from farming. It was my hiatus from agriculture was to go to the military and go around the world for a while. Uh, but when I got out in 2009, this is my lovely wife, Laura, who's my business partner as well. We started our farm, JNL Green Farm, and this has been our full-time deal ever since. <coughs> We're working on three uh, basic principles in how we farm our animals. <clears throat> Number one, we want to understand our ecological context and nature's template. So, you know, rem remembering those pictures from before of big croplands and <coughs> the uh, CAFOs, we actually farm in this kind of ground. When we understand our, our ecological context, that means what will the land allow us to produce? Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to take this farm and put 300 cows on it, first we're going to ask the question, what can this piece of ground, how many cows can it sustainably support? And we're going to orient our production around that number. We're also going to look at what is a natural template for animals being raised. You know, in nature, our cows crowd, crowded into tight little spaces and standing in their own manure for 100 days. They're not, they're constantly moving across the landscape. And there's a lot of beneficial reasons for that that um, I'm not gonna go into because I think we're crunching up on time, but what we are doing is trying to mimic how animals behave in this natural context on our farm without them going to visit the neighbors. Because if we just, uh, threw open the gates and let the cows go wherever they want, like the buffalo used to do, well, they'd probably be overeating the neighbor's garden, and that does not do well for public relations. So we can use technology now in the form of solar panels and electric fence uh, to move the animals around the farm and put them wherever the forage is most ready for them to consume. So this would be a group of cows on our farm, uh, they will be in this area for maybe two days, and they will eat all the grass down. We will then move them on to a new spot, and this area would get anywhere from 30 to 60 days for that ecology to recover from the impact of all these animals. There's a lot of trampling, there's a lot of manure going <coughs> down, um, there's a lot of plants being eaten. We need to give those plants time to recover from that fairly traumatic experience. The second principle that we operate around is animals' natural expression and their role in the ecosystem. Animals play an extremely critical role in a healthy ecosystem. Without animals, there would not be an environment. It would be Mars. And this goes all the way back to birds consuming fish and then pooping it on land. 
uh, and minerals being transported. There's actually an oceanic land nutrient cycle that occurs. Um, so we are going to use the animals in how they would interact with the natural system to accomplish the same thing on our farm. We also want to allow natural expression. So what that means is we're going to let the animal be what the animal is. We're not going to put the pig in a little crate, which are really about the size of this table, about how big they are. We're not going to put their, her in there for her own her whole life. Pigs like to be out and rooting in the dirt and rubbing on trees and laying in mud puddles on hot days and um, you know not being in these tight crates when they're giving birth to their babies. So this is a little shelter that we use and she goes in there and makes a nest however she wants and this is a, a litter of day old little piggies and she's relaxed in there. She can leave and go out to a paddock that's maybe half an acre big whenever she wants but um, it, it allows her to express those mothering instincts and we found it's far more beneficial to the animals. Our pigs never get sick. I should say never. I've treated one sick pig in almost 10 years of doing it this way. Um, our pigs are not stressed. If you talk to a pig farmer who's doing it in those CAFO barns, um, they will tell you about pigs biting people and you know, you know, getting stabbed in the leg by a tooth or something like that and you know, getting a massive staph infection set in. Our pigs are not like that because their stress is, is gone. They're allowed to do pig things, root in the ground, get covered in dirt, do whatever they want. And so it's the same template that we're going to use, whether it's pigs, whether it's cows, or whether it's chickens. We're going to look at its natural or its wild cousins and say, how does that animal uh, behave in an ecosystem? What, um, what type of terrain does it like? You know, pigs are more of a wood creature than a pasture creature. So most of our pigs are run in the woods. Uh, herbivores are more of a pasture creature because they need the grass and so on. And we're going to try to mimic that as much as we can on our farm. Who here has watched the nature documentaries where you see the big herd of wildebeest or whatever running across the plains uh, and there's huge flocks of birds moving with them and there's lions in the bushes and you know you see this uh, multi-speciation of animals on any particular piece of ground. It's not just cows here or it's not just turkeys or just um, chickens. You see these different <coughs> layers of, of animals on the same piece of ground. So that's something we do with our farm as well. We'll move cows through an area. Afterwards, we would bring through some chickens. Now, the nice thing is chickens love fly maggots. So we can let cows do what they naturally like to do. We let the chickens, which are our version of the egrets, you know, it's hard to keep egrets on the farm, so we can't do it with them. So we're going to use chickens, and the chickens will come behind the cows. They'll scratch apart those cow pies that they leave behind, their little calling cards, um, pasture chips, some people try to call them in polite society. <coughs> chickens are going to scratch all of that apart looking for those fly larvae. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to reduce the number of flies that are buzzing around torturing the cows in the summer. And it's going to give some protein to the chickens. And it's going to spread the manure across a bigger area of the pasture so we don't get a little dead spot in the pasture. Um, wait till later on in the summer, as you drive by a cow farm, look out, you'll probably see a green polka dot pattern over the, over the pasture. That's where the cow, the pasture chips um, are, are dropped, the cow pies, and the, the grass becomes too toxic in that spot from the nutrients <coughs> for the cow to re eat. She doesn't want to eat that unless she's really forced to. The chickens are solving all of that for us. And all we have done is just be the instrument of timing. That when we move the cows off, we're going to move the chickens in. Then there's another picture of a sow here that had 16 piglets that morning. Um, you can see she built herself a nice nest there. Pigs are actually a nesting kind of animal. Um, I've seen them rip down trees that big around and build an eagle's nest uh, to have their babies in. And you don't mess with them for days because they kind of fortress themselves in there. All right. Wrap it up quickly here. Some more pigs on pasture, having a good time. This is how we do our chickens. A little bit more multi-species here. This is our sheep and the egg layers together doing their thing. Sheep are eating down forage, which opens, exposes the soil for the chickens to come in and scratch and eat the bugs, gently massaging open the soil cap that's there, and then everything moves on. So this is how I like to spend the uh, <coughs> late afternoons of some of my days. I just go sit down. There's a big group of, uh, of piglets here. We keep the sows in one particular area with using electric fence, but the babies can go wherever they want. 
until we catch them and begin to train them to fence. So their moms are probably way away from here, and they're just calling piglet gangs, just roaming around the farm. And you sit down, they'll come up to you, they'll start chewing on your boots, start chewing on your pants. And it's a, a very relaxing zen experience there at the end of the day. And what we're showing, and farms like us are showing, and Polyface is showing, is that we can produce animal protein in a way that's not degrading the environment. That's not destroying the topsoil. We're not polluting the, the, the Chesapeake Bay. We don't have to have a fundraiser to offset the uh, costs to decontaminate this, you know, the downstream ecology that we've poisoned with what we're doing. But it all has to orient around us responding to what nature allows us to do instead of saying, hey, we're going to put 20,000 dairy cows in this one location and um, you know, the environment be damned. I don't think, though, we can blame historical agriculture for as much of the damage done <coughs> because these people were just trying to survive. Half their babies were dying before they were three years old. Wolves were literally eating their animals outside their little stone huts. Um, we, you know, is the blame of where agriculture is today placed on them? I, I don't think so. They were just trying to survive and have enough food to last the winters. And they didn't know near as much about the consequences of what they were doing as we do now. We know what soil uh, biology does. We know what oversaturation of nutrients does. We know what happens when you break a carbon cycle, when you break the oceanic land nutrient cycle. We know these things now. So now the responsibility is on us to make the correct, uh, the correct adjustments to our practices. I think we have much less excuse. Technology changes everything. Unfettered technology can destroy everything just as easily as it can be used to repair it. Can we use technology to restore ecosystems and environments? We certainly can. Can we also use the same technology to, to accelerate the destruction <coughs> of an environment? Absolutely. So to show you guys, there's some of the tools. Uh, technology is a, a new tool that we have in the toolbox. What we and farmers like us are building is something new. We're really going back to the drawing board and saying, all right, we know the chicken CAFO is extremely efficient at converting grain into chickens, but at what cost? So do we need to adjust what we're doing? We know that one person can manage 2,400 of those breeding sows in one building, but what is the cost of doing that? Not just in the wallet, what is the, look at it in a 500 year, picture. What's, what's it going to cost us in 500 years to do this? And we're looking at this much bigger, what we would call holistic perspective on how we produce our food. We're combining ecology with technology. And we don't have to use technology to overpower the environment. Instead, we use it to mimic patterns we see in nature, but we do it at scale on our farms. So on our farm, we uh, have 90 of those breeding sows. We raise hundreds of pigs that go to bacon and pork chops every year. And instead of having a building that costs, would cost me half a million dollars to build, that I would be mortgaged on for the next 20 years and really indebted into growing pigs for whoever the buyer is, this is all that we're using to contain these pigs. I don't know if you can see that thread of fence right there. Because we've gone all the way back to the drawing board and said, do we even need a building? And we've answered that question. No, we don't need a building to do it, except for key times like when that mama's having her babies. We will give her a building out there in the pasture for her to have her babies in. So this is the technology that we are using on our farm to run our pits. <coughs> there's fence, there's a little weed whacker in there that we'll you know, mow the grass with when we need to put the fence up. There's rebar, there's a hammer, and uh, you can't see it, but way back here is a uh, solar energizer, which captures uh, solar power, puts it into a battery, and it is pulsing an electric charge down that line and keeping those pigs where we want them. And when they're ready to move, which was 30 seconds after this picture was taken because they knew we were moving them and they're all there ready to go, <laughs> we, can, we can then be the conductor of these animals moving across the landscape instead of being kind of the dictator of how these animals are going to express themselves. The last thing I wanted to jump on quick was, does it matter? Does what each of us do and does it, what each of us eat matter? And I'm not talking about becoming obese and 450 pounds and you know, the things that um, you guys can answer far more 
better, you know, with more expertise than I can, but I'm talking about these farm systems, topsoil, and so on. We go back to the first question, is eating meat bad? And we look at some of these foundational premises that are used against consuming meat. One of them can kind of be boiled down to eating without killing. Can we eat without killing things? And that's essentially the basis of, I would say, the vegan argument. However, this is a false premise. There cannot be life without death. But I do believe it is how we honor that life that matters. <clears throat> so a comparative study was done in Australia on how many animal deaths occur to produce 100 kilograms of usable protein. I mean, that's the best thing to do. Let's just put them side by side, see which one. Uh, you know, if we, if we are entertaining the uh, question of how many animals have to die for us to eat and have protein, let's put it side by side and see what it turns out to be. When consuming herbivores that are fed a grass-based uh, diet, like our cows are here, one thing I did not have time to jump into as much as I would like to is an herbivore does not need to eat grain. Nature has equipped them with an operating system where they can convert the cellulose material of forages into protein. It's pretty cool. They're feeding a colony of trillions of bacteria in their rumen, which is a four compartment stomach. Those bacteria are secreting the, uh, the nutrients that the cow needs. And so the cow is in about two steps taking sunlight to protein. We could remove a big section of the argument um, against meat by just stop feeding grain to cows and to dairy because they can already do it on their own with forage. This, is, this was a series of pictures that I took um, last year. We were in kind of a mild drought and these are all same day within maybe a 10 mile radius of our farm. This is I was driving around. These are pastures here that are um, what we would call conventional systems. So the, the cows are on them all the time. Cows are just out there doing their thing. And you can see how they're pretty much have turned to, you know, just a brown landscape. As the forage has been removed, sunlight is now penetrating down to the soil. And it's heating the soil up, evaporating the water, and your water, uh, your, your moisture content of the soil has disappeared, and the plants go into hibernation. This is the same day over on our farm. Same amount of cows. Actually, we're doing more cows than they are within five miles of each other, what are we doing differently? We're mimicking how these animals behave in a natural setting, and we're doing that on the farm. I get deep into the reasons why this is green and that's dry, but just trust me, the system does work, and it's demonstrated on farms far bigger than our own. So back to uh, consuming, consuming meat for 100 kilograms of usable protein in this study that was done. When consuming herbivores, so animals that are not being fed grain, to produce 100 kilograms of usable protein, 2.2 animals are dying for that to occur. To produce 100 kilograms of, uh, of usable protein from an animal-free diet, they want to take a guess how many animals die for that? 55. <coughs> All right. Anyone want to guess why? Because of the tillage. We have to till those fields to plant the plants. So if we're gonna address that question from an ethical uh, perspective, who's responsible for more animal deaths? Our second question, how do we feed everyone? I think this is a fairly easy one to answer. We feed everyone by caring first for the planet that sustains us, by working with our ecosystems instead of exploiting them. Now this will require a massive shift in mindset and policy, but there is plenty of space on the planet to feed all of us including the three billion that are coming in the next 20 to 30 years. So maybe a good start for us, you know, we're talking about what do we do, you and I, a good start is to plant some gardens and supply our own neighborhood. After all, there are 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. There's more lawn in the United States than there are cornfields. The simple, the most simple and sustainable and efficient protein conversion process on land is the herbivore consuming mass amounts of forages and ruminating it to digestible proteins. The next best is an omnivorous animal consuming high levels of wasted food products. Remember, 30 to 50 percent of our food is wasted. Shouldn't throw it in the landfill, let's do something with it. 
animals, so we have animals that are consuming these wasted products, and also planting diverse crops grown in regenerative systems. The dead last thing is a monospeciated carbon cycle breaking, petroleum heavy, topsoil depleting, ecology polluting systems that do nothing more than feed an insatiable desire for nutritionally avoid cheap food. This is a big scale picture of what we're doing on our farm. These guys have a lot more pasture than we do. But these cows are moving every day across this landscape. We're talking about waste food. This is uh, something that I think is pretty cool about all the pigs we raise on our farm. About 50% of the food that they are consuming is waste. Uh, there's a lot of orchards in the area. So for about six months out of the year, we are getting apples from either a packing shed or from an orchard that have fallen on the ground. You know, when an apple falls off a tree in the ground in the orchard, they cannot sell it. It is now an inedible food item. A lot of apples fall off trees before everybody gets in there to pick them up. But we can feed them to pigs. This is actually, you guys should recognize that hill right there. Uh, this is out in uh, Kieseltown, pumpkin patches in the fall. Everybody likes to go out and get the Halloween <coughs> pumpkin and all that. Well, this is uh, three days after Halloween. So this is what's left. And we can come in and pick all of those up. Not much in each pumpkin, but the seeds inside each pumpkin are, I think, 30% protein. Uh, the, the biggest one for us is what I'm holding in my hand here. Uh, this is peanuts. So you see a whole peanut there. There's a lot of the skins of little pieces that fall off of it. This is coming from a peanut mill in North Carolina where they're processing your peanuts for, you know, planters peanuts or whatever. This one plant generates 100 tons <coughs> of wasted peanuts every month. That's just the throwaway stuff. I have no idea how much they produce that actually gets eaten by people and for peanut butter, but there's 100 tons a month that would just get thrown in the landfill if people like us were not buying them and feeding them back to our pigs. So, you know, have we solved the problem of uh, <coughs> getting away from grain with our uh, omnivorous creatures like pigs and chickens? No, we're still feeding grain. Probably our, our least sustainable meat that we do is chicken. We do feed them some of the peanuts, but to get that broiler chicken to grow fast um, and efficiently, we are using a lot of grain. But in ways that we can, we're looking for how do we utilize this waste stream that is just laying on the ground or being buried in the landfill. On the nutritional side, this is what you guys do. One chicken in 1970 now takes six chickens worth to get the same omega-3 fatty acid from that one chicken. I thought that blew my mind. So what each of us does matters immensely when we look at economics. This is the number one way that we can make an impact for sustainable local food. Average family in the United States spends $6,224 on food per year. Of that actual, uh, of that amount, the farmers receive 7.8% of what you are spending on food. So I think that's um, that little sliver right there. Everything else is going to middle processors, retailers, uh, what we call value adding. You know, the, the people that are taking, say, that peanut that the farmer grows all the way to the little 1.5 ounce package that you can buy in the vending machine. That's where the rest of it is being consumed. A direct to retail farm is capturing a much higher percentage, let's say around 50 to 60 percent of the, of the retail dollar. If a young couple starting a farm has just 300 people in a community buying their meat, eggs, or produce on a regular basis, they would be successful and sustainable as a business. So, look, Rockingham County has an approximate population of 80,000 people. That's enough to cover 250 farms just in this county, which would employ thousands of people to locally distribute food, and it keeps the revenue inside of the community. Uh, st uh, statistic I heard just the other day on the radio from a local Chamber of Commerce ad or whatever, we're saying every $1 that is spent in a local community causes $47 of additional economic activity inside of that community. So where we spend our money on our food can have an immense impact in directing the way that we want agriculture to go. There are millions of people within a 150 mile radius of here. You can, see what, you can do the math and see where I'm going with this. We don't need to be importing our beef from Australia or our soybeans from South America or where, you know, where these other things are coming from. I will give an exception to pineapples because I love to eat them and they will not grow here and oranges. But there's no reason for things that we can grow in our own communities to be brought in from elsewhere. 
simply on an economic argument. We can, we can discuss the environmental side, it's a totally different argument. But it has to start with people like you guys and me making conscientious decisions on where we direct our votes. Our vote is our money. Every time we eat, we vote. When we drink, we vote, unless it's water. All those sugary drinks that, that uh, we love to consume, that's corn. That's corn syrup, that's where it's coming from. So when we cast our votes, are we casting votes for further topsoil lo loss, for further inhumane animal treatment, for dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico? Or are we voting for healing with how we spend our money? Are we eating for health, for the health of our land, the dirt that we rely on for life, solar conversion process that can feed the world, for the health of our own body? Every day we vote several times. So may we all have the courage to vote well. Questions? What do you guys got for me? I know that was a lot of info. Uh, Go. So you talked a lot about like <clears throat> your farming system and how it's so much more beneficial compared to the other conventional ones. But I am confused because again you talked about the high population growth. So with that. Like, obviously, like, your farming methods probably work, but for your smaller amount of farm animals compared to those bigger industries that, yes, don't have all the space because they don't take the time. They don't take the time to do all the, like, better things they should be doing because they're trying to make a faster buck, because they're trying to feed more people, because they have so many more animals to contain. So how would you kind of, like, if you were talking, I know you're talking to us, but if you were talking to them to get them to kind of move to those better ways of treating the animals, how would you do that considering they have so many more? A lot of, so a lot of things there. One, I, when I talk to them, they think we're idiots and we're stupid. That's why I like to change people who are eating because what does big industry respond to? Declining sales. Uh, you know, that's what, I mean, look at what Facebook is going through right now. They're getting some pressure for some stuff that went on in their stock tanks, you know, $5 billion or whatever. And next thing you know, Mark is sitting up there at Capitol Hill, you know, playing the sorry game with the politicians. Um, but back to your question, when you look at, uh, say, like that capo full of chickens, like every poultry house that you see in this community around here, you're like, wow, there's a lot of chickens being grown in that tiny little space. You have five acres, uh, and it's producing over a million chickens a year. What you don't see is the cropland behind that. Every one of those houses requires <coughs> 900 acres of crop production somewhere. So whether you go out west or you're in South America or wherever the cheapest grain is coming from on that particular week, there's 900 acres represented elsewhere in agricultural production for that chicken house to sit there and consume those grains. So it's really just a, a question of uh, disbursement of the activity, that it's it's an efficient process to put a bunch of animals in a tight little barn, but it's not because we don't have enough space for them. It's because it's it's efficient to a mechanical process. Um, so what would have to change in the industry is their mindset of we're going to use instead of the chickens sitting here and turning the Shenandoah Valley into the toilet bowl of the East Coast. And you know, most of the wells in the Shenandoah Valley are now contaminated with E. coli from all the nutrient runoff and phosphorus levels are high and so on. Um, what if we put all those chickens out where the crops are being grown and we can begin to return that nutrient cycle from those chickens back to where the, the grain is being grown? So on the surface, it can look like, how can we do it? There's not enough space. There is enough space. You just don't see it because it's not where the animals are. It's, it's elsewhere. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, an outfit called the Rodale Institute where they said, all right, let's take the arguments of, say, conventional crop production where we're using tillage, we're using Roundup, you know, we're using GMOs, all that stuff. Let's put that side by side with a regenerative organic system um, and let's do 10, 20, 30 years of these things side by side. A lot of uh, crop trials that are done, say, by, I'm just going to pick on Virginia Tech or whoever else, uh, an ag school, their numbers are skewed because they're doing them in a one-year snapshot. They're taking a field that may have last year been sprayed with Roundup and has a low, uh, a low microbe activity in the soil, and they're saying, that's our, that's our organic field for this year, and then we're going to compare it to 
um, you know, the fertilized field over here. Well, of course it's gonna suck because it doesn't have the biology activated in the soil to support it. So what the Rodale Institute has done, they said, let's do it in 20 to 30 year pictures. And right now their organic production um, is producing at the same rate of conventional. So we don't even need more land to do this. We just have to look at it at more than a six month or one year window. We need to look at it in a 10 year window, a 100 year window. Like I said, it's a thousand years to produce three centimeters of topsoil. So, uh, you know, if I'm standing in my field and I'm like, I want to build one inch of topsoil here, well, better get cracking because it's going to take till 3017 to do so. Uh, do you have a question? Um, I was wondering, are a lot of farmers taking towards the steps that you're taking or are they just ignoring it? <laughs> Right now, this type of agriculture probably accounts for one to two percent of all food produced in the United States. It's very small. Um, you know, when we talk about an agricultural orthodoxy, that is a set in stone, uh, you know, canonized uh, ideology as firm as almost any religion that you will find. Where uh, I was looking a couple of years ago for a term to kind of encapsulate what I've seen that. And what I came across was a financial term, actually, it's called path dependency. Basically, the simple form of it is, uh, say it snows 30 inches of the snow outside, you walk to your car the first time you break the trail. Well, which way are you gonna walk next time? You're gonna walk on that same trail. And then the more you walk on that trail, the more it becomes the path that you're going to take, and why would you go another way? Because you're gonna break through new ground to get there. We're gonna go this way. Um, that's why I think there's some universities that are uh, when they build a new building, not putting sidewalks in for a couple of years just to see where people naturally walk to the building and that's where the sidewalk will end up going. Um, you know, they're kind of waiting for where the path dependency gets going and that's what's occurring or has occurred in a lot of conventional agriculture. That we're still operating in the mindset of we need to confine the animals in a building because outside there's lions and wolves that want to eat our animals. You know, if you go to third world countries, they still bring their animals in the house at night because the predators are out there, um, or you know, the humans are out there who would steal your animals. We still have that mindset in conventional agriculture that we have to put the animals in a building, we gotta grow the grain somewhere else and bring it to the animals. What we haven't reassessed really is, well now we have different technology. You know, if you went back 1700 and said, hey, we want you to move your cows every day on pasture, your average farmer would probably have a heart attack on the spot. Because what's his method for keeping those cows in one place? Stone wall, which takes you know, one day to build 10 feet stone wall, or it's a board fence, which is pretty labor intensive to do as well. But what's changed now is in 30 minutes, I can move a herd of 500 cows from one place to the other by just putting up some rebar, some um, you know, wire, some twine that runs across there that has little stainless steel filaments in it, and then I'm connecting it to this box that's collecting radiation from the sun and converting it into positive and negative electrons and storing it in a battery and then it's pulsing it out and spooling it up 10,000 volts through the line. So when that cow touches it, it pops her in the nose and it psychologically trains her not to ever touch that fence and stay where I put her. If I told that to my <coughs> farmer back in, let's say, 1500, how many of you want to bet I probably would be burned at the stake? It'd be some kind of sorcery going on, okay? But we're still operating in an old mindset without scoping out enough to say, whoa, can we change our entire operating paradigm of what we're doing instead of just technologically advancing the path that we're already on? Does that make sense? So a lot of it's just like a lack of education among farmers? Maybe. I'd say a lack of creative thought. Uh, you know, if you're good at growing a crop of corn, you're going to stay good at growing a crop of corn. You know, the answer, you talk to conventional ag guys, um, you know, with corn prices right now, for several years have been in the pits. You ask them, hey, what should you do to make your farm profitable? Because this growing corn thing isn't working out for you. You know what their answer is? Well, I have a 12 row planter. If I just had a 16 row planter, I'd be profitable. So, you know, the, the, the mindset can, is not broken out of the paradigm. It's, well, I just gotta plant more. I gotta do it more efficiently. Instead of, instead of kind of telescoping all the way out to say, and what am I doing here? Does that even make sense anymore? And examining you know, where we've come from in the last couple hundred years and why we are where we are right now.